Welcome, Dare to Dream podcast, radio, YouTube. It is such a pleasure to be here. This is Debbie Dashinger, just fresh off doing press media for the Los Angeles Conscious Life Expo. I actually forget, it's, I had a skip last year, I had to send my assistant to go perform all the interviews in my place. And with that one year in between, I forgot how many people I know there. It was actually this amazing reunion of old clients and uh, people that I know in the metaphysical tribe and hearing speakers who I've been interviewing and new people and new thought. I love it. I really love it. And I did a little bit more exploring this time with an open mind around UFOs. That was new for me. Um, and I'm really grateful I did. I'm really grateful I went and heard some of the people doing extraordinary work out there. And then as well, of course, I went to see my buddies, Greg Braden and uh, David Wolf and Paul Selig, who's about to come on the show and many others. So we don't disappoint because we have somebody, again, just amazing, who's going to be here. And she's fresh off the Los Angeles Conscious Life Expo. I'll tell you more about her in a moment, but excited to have this upcoming conversation. And I want to thank you all because this show is where it is because of you. And oh my goodness, I've been asking you to leave comments and reviews. And guess what? You've been doing it. And I do read them. I haven't had a lot of chance to write back, but I promise you, I have read them. Not only that, but did you know that your reviews go out to Chartable and they go out to multiple sites? And so people who want to find this conversation read your words and they click on and subscribe just like you did. So definitely subscribe to the show. It's been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards. It's available on over 40 syndicated outlets. And you can, just for great ease, go to Apple and Google. Google Podcasts, Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, YouTube, BBS Radio, Pandora, iHeartRadio, and more. And I learned the other day that Dare to Dream is ranked number 200 in self-improvement on Apple Podcasts in the whole USA. We rank in the top 10 in several countries, also 148 in South Africa, 20 in Vietnam, 21 in Slovakia, and on and on. So I love that this is a global conversation, and it is your number one transformation conversation. I want to thank the sponsors of this show because they're magnificent people. Dr. Dean here and Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. And if you would like to become a facilitator or attend one of their very healing workshops anywhere in the world, go to Dr. Dean here, H-E-E-R, Dot com or accessconsciousness.com. My question to you is, would you like to feel better? And if so, you can get to know your biofield. My guest is Dr. Shamani John, founder and CEO of the Consciousness and Healing Initiative for the Scientific Study and Awareness of the Effectiveness of Biofield Healing. Dr. John is a psychologist, researcher, and teacher. She's founder and CEO of the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, which is a collaborative accelerator of scientists, healers, artists, educators, and social entrepreneurs to help humanity heal ourselves. She's also an assistant professor at UC San Diego and is known for her research and teaching in psycho neuroimmunology and biofield healing practices. Her new book about to be launched on the biofield is going to be published with, truth, with Sounds True and that's in 2021. If you'd like to know more about her, go to her website, Shamani, S-H-A-M-I-N-E, John, J-A-I-N dot com. And I welcome Dr. John to the Dare to Dream show. Great to have you. Thank you. Great to be here. I want just, to a, just a quick correction. Um, it's S H A M I N I J A I N Shamini Jan dot com. Tell me about your name because it does sound like shaman, which is a word I'm very akin to. And um, just researching you, your last name J A I N. It seems that it's it's much deeper than just a familial name. So, are there meanings attached to what? you are walking around being called. <laughs> Thank you so much for the question. It's a great question. Um, the last name, Jan, which is also sometimes pronounced Jane, actually refers to a very small religion, sometimes really even almost called a philosophy, called Janism. 
And Jainism, there's probably about 1% of the world that's Jan. So it's a really small religion and it bears some similarity to Buddhism in that the focus is really on spiritual liberation. Um, so very similarly to Buddhism, there's not necessarily a huge focus on worshiping what we might call creator gods, but really going within one's own soul, clearing ourselves of karmic patterns and liberation. Um, the biggest thing that Jainism is known for, though, is the principle of nonviolence. And so if you've you know, heard of, obviously, leaders like Gandhi, I'm sure most of your listeners have heard of Mohandas Gandhi, who liberated India from British rule, he did so with nonviolent means. And he was really very, very inspired by Jan teachings, as was Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela and others. So Jainism is really known a lot for the principles of nonviolence, as well as other principles. Now, as far as... How did you get connected, though? How, how is it that your last name is that? Yeah, so a lot of people who are born into the Jan tradition, so my family's Jan, we've been Jan for generations. Um, some of us have the last name Jan, not all of us. Don't ask me why. <laughs> that kind of has to do with the region that you're from. So having the last name Jan, if you meet somebody that has a last name Jan, the likelihood is they came from the spiritual tradition of Janism and they probably still follow Janism, which I would say is definitely my spiritual home. Hmm. But you might meet other people who are Jan, who don't have the last name Jan. And so if Jan is your spiritual home, I want to know how rock and roll is like your stage persona, because I saw this amazing picture of you, and it looked like it was some kind of an event you did, not you know, your hair, you were just throwing your hair, you had this great outfit on and a microphone. Is singing something you do? Is rock and roll something you're into? Yeah, it is actually. So <laughs> the way I would credit that if I link it back to my heritage is the oxymoron about my life is that I'm a Punjabi Jan. Okay, so my family comes from the state of Punjab, which is in North India, actually close to where Pakistan is now. It's in the northwest corner. Punjabis are generally known, most of the people that live in Punjab, their religious affiliation is Sikhism, but Punjabis are the ones you think of when you think of Bollywood, the Bhangra, you know, that whole business, right? So Punjabis are like super warm-hearted, outgoing, party people, hmm. and Jans are like super austere. <laughs> very austere, very spiritual, and, and often very contained. So we kind of have both facets going on in the family. So, you know, I have my spiritual practice, which I'm very, very deeply connected to. Um, and I like to rock and roll. I've been a singer my whole life, and uh, I've been really active in the tribute and rock scenes in San Diego and been in several bands. We can have a lot of fun talking about that, actually. But, you know, the, really the thread that ties them both together is the power of vibration. Because ever since I was a kid, because I just loved to sing, I would sing around the house, right? And then obviously I started learning mantras, you know, to a degree in the house and stuff. And I started realizing, wow, how powerful is sound, mm. right? How powerful is sound? I started really noticing what sound felt like in my body as I would sing or chant. And it really set me on a path that has gotten me to where I am today, which is obviously enjoying singing and singing in bands, but also studying the nature of vibration. Because early on, having felt that, I thought, wow, there's a lot we don't understand about this. So I started digging into lots of different books, um, you know, and the philosophies behind Vedanta, you know, Indian philosophy, other Eastern philosophy that said, what? Nada Brahma. The world is sound. Mm. And as I grew up, you know, in the Western world, I was born and raised in South Carolina. I, I was privileged enough to go to some of the finest schools and colleges in the, in the country. I started realizing, wow, this... Sound is so subtle that, you know, when we study them with the materialist-based tools that we have, you know, whether we're looking at the brain or the immune system or whatever, we're just scratching the surface. We, you know, we don't even really deeply understand this. So how could I study vibration? And that's where I really encountered the biofield with my first Reiki session, where I could feel the vibration again in my body, facilitated by someone else who was doing this healing work. And I recognized Wow, you know, not only am I feeling its energy in my body, it's not random. You know, this block that I'm feeling, it was actually a very uncomfortable session, the first Reiki session I had, because I was aware of where the energy block was. And when I was tuning into that energy block in my body, I realized how it was connected to these thoughts, emotions, things I needed to let go of. Mm. And when I made, I'll, I'll never forget that session, because when I made that conscious decision 
to let go of that pattern, the energy fully moved. And so it was that that made me realize, wow, this is really powerful. This vibrational healing is very powerful. And I think it's something that we can study. And I think it could benefit a lot of patients. So, you know, from singing rock and roll to around the house, we get to studying, you know, the effects of healing for humanity. It's pretty cool. It is very cool. Thank you for that explanation. I remember the first time I had an experience with healing bowls, with sound bowls. Um, that is so weird. My phone literally just started talking on her own, which is a little bit eerie because it's also <laughs> it's like, it's off. That is so strange. Um, sometimes yeah. I think God is at work in the weirdest ways. So <laughs> I don't know how to how a phone that's God or Google. Out. You know, you have to decide, <laughs> right? But you know, if you're listening to this conversation, it's the conversation to be hearing. <laughs> so uh, the point is, I my first sound bowl healing. I didn't expect anything. This was many years ago. And the woman had these extraordinarily large, I'm sure, incredibly expensive bowls, many of them surrounding me. I laid on a floor. She started to play them. And now I come from a background in music, my family in music, my grandfather in the who's who of international music, singer, was violin player, all of that. So I'm very sensitive. And uh, at some point, I found myself crying, tears streaming down my face. And I was so surprised at the experience, first of all, at the enormous re release that occurred because of the sound and vibration alone. Mm -hmm. And then once that passed, there was this beautiful peace and calm and surrender, again, that the vibration and sound brought to me. And I'm somebody, I'm so sensitive to that vibration and sound. Even if I take an exercise class, if somebody's got the right music or something, something going on that makes me want to move, it's great. If it's way too loud and it's uh, not the right beat, and it actually can throw me off and make it, you know, I have to be mindful about my experience. Uh, so it's interesting. And I want to deep dive into this a little bit taking you from rock and roll and your meditative and the marriage that you have within you to your first Reiki experience. And then this, this awareness that there's something here, there's a block, there's an energy, and then it's released. And how did you go from there to having a connection, if you will, with biofield or an interest or a passion? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, as I said, when I had that session, I was in my early 20s. And I realized that this was the way I was going to study vibration. Actually, you know, just like you, a fellow musician, my first idea was to really study music and its effects on healing. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, okay, since I'm really interested in the nature of vibration, I'm going to study something like Reiki and see what its, effect, its effects are on the whole system. So just, you know, a little bit of context here. So this is the 90s. This is when we were being told as students, you know, I went to Columbia University's neuroscience program as an undergraduate, and they were telling us that there was no plasticity in the brain after age seven. So imagine that, okay? And intuitively, I thought, these guys don't know what they're talking about, right? Because they had maybe five studies suggesting that at the time. So they didn't really have that much data, but they were basing this really strong conclusion because they saw the body as a disconnected system. And, you know, intuitively, and of course, growing up in an Eastern spiritual tradition where we learned about energy, we learned about the nadis, we learned about chakras, we learned about meditation, you know, to some degree, I had a different framework that was informing me to a certain degree that I realized was completely missing from modern Western science and medicine. So it took me a while to find the right discipline. And ultimately I found the discipline of psychoneuroimmunology because it was one of the few systems in the West that was actually beginning to uncover the interconnections between the brain, the immune system and the hormone system. Mm. Now studying something like biofield energy is still considered even to this day, very out there for psychoneuroimmunology. I mean, they're just not, I see biofield science as the natural extension of psychoneuroimmunology. And let me break that down for you a little bit because, you know, 50 years ago when people said our emotions affected our health, they were laughed at, scientists were laughed at, doctors were laughed at. And because of the work in psychoneuroimmunology, we now know that there's a profound effect 
of our emotions on our health and that the brain and the immune system and the gut and the heart are all connected and all intertwined and, and talking with each other. The biofield is really the extension of that, right? Because now we're not just talking about the physical, but we're talking about how what we consider the non-physical, our spirit, right? Our connection of our spirit, how does it affect the body? The biofield is that missing link. And it's what's been described in all of these different cultures for millennia, whether you're talking about Tibetan medicine, Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, native medicine, African medicine, they all deeply understood this. Mm. So, you know, basically I found this discipline. I found a mentor who would support me. I wrote a grant. I got National Institutes of Health funding to do a randomized placebo controlled clinical trial on healing for fatigue in breast cancer patients. It was a very successful study in many regards. And, you know, the study is published. People can find it in the journal Cancer, which is widely read by oncologists. So that's really cool. And essentially what we found was that hands-on healing um, was, you know, was successful in reducing fatigue down to normative levels. So when these women came into the study, they had debilitating amounts of fatigue. And Debbie, I don't know, you probably know this and you probably, you know, have been touched by cancer, either by friends, family, yourself. Most of us have. Yeah. Fatigue is the number one complaint among cancer patients and survivors, and we don't really have good answers on how to treat it. So when I was doing the study, I was, I was in California at UC San Diego, which is where I did my graduate work. I was getting calls from women in Florida, women from everywhere being like, I'm so glad you're looking at this. Nobody is paying attention. And this really sucks. And when I go to my doctor, they're just giving me an SSRI, you know, an antidepressant, because they, they, they think it might help. They just don't understand how to treat this. So we really needed to do something for these women, right? I mean, for all cancer patients, really. What we found is that just by going to eight sessions of energy healing over four weeks, these women dropped from debilitating amounts of fatigue to levels of what you'd find someone on the street. Not only that, but we found that their cortisol levels became normalized. So, you know, we, everything in our body has a rhythm. And what we found was this rhythm is really um, deranged in fatigued and depressed cancer survivors. That's actually even been linked to early mortality in breast cancer patients. So it's pretty major. Um, what we found is that for the women receiving healing, not the ones receiving placebo, you know, or nothing at all, their cortisol rhythms normalize. So it suggests to us that healing does affect us all the way down to the physiological level. Not that that's the only thing that's important, but you know, a lot of skeptics will be like, oh, this is just placebo. And, you know, we can wax on what placebo means all day long. I have a whole model for that that I like to share with people because placebo is powerful, but we really don't understand it because we're not approaching it from the level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, once we approach things from the level of consciousness, it all makes more sense. So, yeah. So it's very interesting. So you're talking about ancient wisdom. There are all these societies that have been aware of this. Um, maybe the work you're doing and the publications you're offering is just starting to uncover what's already been there. And there's the sense energy matters. What's going on within us is actually going to impact us. And we can turn that around and actually use it to heal ourselves instead. It sounds like it's a subtle energy are there ways that we can access the pathways to use it, shift it in order to heal ourselves instead of impact ourselves? Absolutely. It's such a great and powerful and important question. You know, there are a few things that we can do off the bat that, you know, have been based in research, but more importantly, in ancient practices, too, that have followed us for millennia. The first thing that I suggest to people is that we ground. Okay, mm -hmm. so I also study with Reverend Rosalind Bruyere, who's a master oh. in healing and also the oracle for the Tibetan Ponpo tradition. As you might know Rosalind, yeah? I do. Yeah. yeah, most people know Rosalind. She's, you know, she's incredible. And I've been very fortunate to study with her over the years. And in fact, Rosalind uh, is the one who informed my study because when I wanted to do this, I went to Rosalind and I said, if, if you wanted to do something for fatigue breast cancer survivors, what would you do? And she said chelation. So that's, that's the technique that we used. We called it energy chelation and it's based on Rosalind's work. Um, so grounding is something that Rosalind has always emphasized to us as healers, but you don't have to be doing energy healing on another person to get the benefits of grounding. If you are doing energy work, it's really important to ground. But for all of us it is. And what does that look like? It's simply getting into our bodies. And the easiest way to do that 
is to simply take a breath and I'll invite everyone to just do this now. Let's do it together, mm -hmm. right? So wherever we are, even if we're in the car, whatever, we're gonna just sit and take a breath and place our attention on the soles of our feet. Now what we know is that the biofield of the earth actually affects our human biofield. There have been a number of studies that have been done on grounding, you know, with different devices that are showing us that our biofield connects with the earth's biofield. It affects our heart, it affects our immune system, our mood, even our sleep. But an easy practice is just to get into the feet and feel our connection with the earth. And we send the breath, taking a nice, you know, healthy breath, not forcing it, but just sending our breath all the way down the legs, into the feet, down to Mother Earth, and then allowing her to bless us with her energy coming up the feet from our chakras, major chakras that we have on the soles of the feet, we can actually feel that energy coming back up in our bodies from the feet into the legs, up the thighs, into the hips, the belly, the heart, our spine, our neck, down the arms our throat, head, and our crown. So we're one with the earth. And every time we take a breath, just with this very simple practice, we're connecting with Mother Earth. We support Mother Earth and Mother Earth supports us. This is one of the most powerful ways that we can renew our biofield every day. Mm, beautiful. May I ask you, is this, I, well, it is different because we're, I, I'm doing it in an office right now, but there's something I've recently seen on YouTube about earthing, a documentary about earthing, mm -hmm. and it was really compelling. Tell me your thoughts about that. Absolutely. It's some great work that's been done by my colleagues, Jim Oshman, Gaetan Chevalier. They've been doing lots of work on earthing, and most of the research, again, with earthing is generally looking at devices that we call grounding mats or grounding you know, devices that actually electrically connect us with the earth. So we lay on a mat that's sort of plugged in um, into an outlet and is grounded and we lay on that. And there have been, gosh, it, you know, several studies now that have demonstrated that grounding is effective for reducing inflammation, mm -hmm. you know, grounding or earthing are kind of the same. Um, for affecting not only our immune system, but our sleep, depression, anxiety, even in athletes to some degree performance. So there's really something to it. As far as I know, no one has done the study with the kind of practice that I just shared with you because people have been looking at these grounding devices. However, consider the amount of studies that have been done in forest bathing, which is a common practice in Japan, okay? Now, there's a bit of a stretch here because we haven't really looked to see whether what the bioenergetic change is in people when they go. But what they have found is that by simply going into the forest, again, you see these same benefits, similar benefits, reduced anxiety, reduced depression, increased sense of peace, improved hormonal function. So the same kinds of findings are being found for going into the forest and forest bathing and grounding. And you What know, is forest bathing? Is this like... It's simply going into the forest and taking a hike. <laughs> it's really that simple. It's, you don't even have to be barefoot, right? So the one thing I will say is that proponents of earthing will say, you know, don't wear rubber soled shoes right. because those are going to just, you know, you want to really have that electrical connection with the earth. So people will say, you can go barefoot, you can wear moccasins, you can wear cloth, you know, you can wear other kinds of things. You don't, I don't think you necessarily have to buy a device to get grounded. I think that you can do these practices and connect with the earth and get grounded. And there's something even of just us getting into our bodies and spiritually connecting 
with the earth, right? That's beneficial. So there are all these different facets to earthing. There's the spiritual aspect. There's the bioenergetic aspect. Um, there's the emotional aspect, all of it. And it's all, it, it all comes together. It's all very healthy for us. So Rosalind Bruyere suggests chelation. And uh, you're talking, that was a beautiful exercise, by the way. Thank you so much. I can feel the shift without a doubt. And so simple. Mm -hmm. so simple can be done oh, anywhere. Because, what, one minute two minutes you can do it anyway do it before a meeting you can do it you know before the kids come home like whatever you know it's it takes like two seconds and it just gets us back in our bodies you know we live from the waist up most of us as Rosalind would, <laughs> would say herself you know we're working we're constantly thinking and you know again what did the ancients say uniting the mind with the vital force is where the magic is Mm, uniting the mind with a vital force. That's beautiful. Thank you. So besides this grounding technique, are there other ways that we can alter our biofield and get ourselves back in the path and also start to heal ourselves, change our immune system and, you know, shift up that vibration you're talking about? You bet. Well, let's talk about emotions for a minute because this is what trips up most of us, okay? So there's a lot to say about the bioenergy of emotions and how they can stay in our field. And one common question I get a lot, Debbie, and I'm sure that you probably get this question as well, is people will say, oh, man, I just can't be around this toxic person I, or I go into this room and you know, I feel totally drained when I leave, you know, I don't know what to do, or, you know, I'm an empath, and I feel the emotions of others. And even when I'm around my friends, if they're suffering, like, I feel that greatly. And sometimes I feel drained. So, you know, the question is, why does that happen? And what can we do about it? So again, the more that we're grounded, the more that we can actually take in the feelings of others and not necessarily be bowled over by them. Okay, so let's just go over the chakras for a minute. I'm sure most of your readers or listeners know about the chakras, okay? The root is, of course, simply I am, okay? Mm -hmm. It's just our foundational being. So when we do these practices like grounding, we're simply just coming into being. That's mm -hmm. what's happening, right? The second chakra, and again, I, I learned this from Rosalind, the second chakra is about our first feeling, okay? So that's about how we feel. So if we're not grounded, if we're not in our feet, if we're not in our lower bodies, then we're not really registering and processing our own feelings. What happens is, you know, if we skip to the heart, the heart is where we feel others. So when we start taking in the emotions of everybody and everything around us, and we're not grounded, we're not processing our first feelings, that's where the trouble sets in, right? That's where we get thrown off of our axis. So one really easy bioenergetic exercise that I suggest to people, and quite frankly, I do this on a regular basis all the time, just because even if things are really great, sometimes we just have a lot of input, you know, coming in us. And it's like, what do I do to clear that field? Again, we take a deep breath, we fill our bodies. And you know, this is a singer. What are you going to do? You're going to expand your rib cage. You're going to take that breath and put it all the way in your body. And then simply exhale. Now, here's an interesting hack. The yogis always said that longer exhales, and they have all these different pranayama, beautiful breathing exercises, right? They always said that long exhales were useful for relaxing the body. We now know that long exhales actually activate the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is what stimulates our parasympathetic rest and digest system, okay? So simply by taking good inhales and long exhales, first of all, we're activating that rest and digest part of our nervous system. On the bioenergetic level, when we breathe deeply into our belly and our entire bodies, including our lower bodies, and then we release, we're simply helping to release stuck energy in our fields that doesn't need to be there anymore. So when you get heavy news or you just feel a little bit overwhelmed, simply going back to the breath, filling your body with prana, and then releasing it. And it does really work well when you find yourself in an emotionally tenuous situation. Mm -hmm. Just try it. And, and pay attention to what the lower body is doing. Pay attention to what your second chakra is telling you. You know, what does the energy there feel like? Does it feel tight? Does it feel flowing? Mm -hmm. That'll give you some clues as to like, what am I really feeling here? Because sometimes we're afraid to feel ourselves. So mm -hmm. really important to tune into that second chakra. 
I sometimes wonder if we're afraid to feel ourselves because we're afraid if we know our truth, we'll have to take action. Mm, that's a great, well, that's, that's a really interesting point, Debbie, because, you know, and there are other people that it's almost the opposite, right? It's so let's talk about this for a minute because it's so valuable. And we explore this in a chakra perspective, right? Mm. Everybody talks about the throat chakra, speaking my truth, right? So we haven't talked a lot about the solar plexus chakra. What's going on there, okay? So if the first chakra is I am, and the second chakra, our sacral chakra, is I feel, then the third chakra or the solar plexus chakra is actually I think, Right. And this is it's like this is the part of our personal alchemy. Right. We feel we, we are we feel and then we think we digest. We start releasing. You know, this is associated with the air element, the, the third chakra and fire. So we begin to dissolve away the things that don't serve us. And then we take in the feelings of others and then we speak or we hold silence. Now, what happens if we bypass this? Oh boy, if I feel something and I'm just working from the second chakra and I just vomited out <laughs> my throat, right? I haven't digested, I haven't considered, I haven't aired out my feelings and I haven't taken in the feelings of others. Mm. So this is why it's really cool to kind of go through the body as we process our life. Because, you know, once we actually give ourselves a little pause to Feel everything bioenergetically. What's happening in these energy centers right now as I'm experiencing this reality? We're much more likely to say something wise instead of stupid <laughs> or know when we need to speak and when it's not really worth it to speak. Yeah. Right? Discernment. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. So from throat, then, then what's happening in our system? Okay. Well, so the third eye is about gaining insight right again and the crown is about full surrender to the divine so i love this area and i actually teach this i i've done a, a workshop um which i still do i'm doing workshops on the well of being at esalen this year in september and i also do a really great workshop it's gonna be at 1440 called embody the goddess so we talk a lot about all of these different types of how we connect bioenergetically and i sometimes describe these as triads which you know many people do the top triad if you will the throat the third eye, the crown. This is where we can really start um, playing with divinity and divine spirit for true co-creation. So here it's not about me, right? We're really moving into service, into that divine guidance that helps us, again, do things in divine timing because the throat is very much about timing, right? The thyroid, you can think about this. So here's where, you know, when we're working full body, being embodied and really listening to what each energy in the chakra is telling us and really fully utilizing our bioenergy to co-create with the divine, that's where all kinds of magic can happen. Mm. Magic, I love it. Well, we're gonna come back and you know, I can't take it that you brought up embodying the goddess. So uh, we're gonna have to talk about that just a little bit on the flip side of this very compelling. And I thank all of you for being here today. Continue to write in. And I want to let you know that the next Ultimate Visibility Formula class is about to begin. And you can register at debbied.net slash visibility. Just remember, Debbie doesn't have an E at the end. So it's D-E-B-B-I net slash visibility and ultimate visibility formula is about how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts with great results in 60 days or less. So basically within six weeks of taking the class, you will already be interviewed. You'll receive live coaching from me. You'll get the entire system, including contacts of where the shows are, your media kit and your pitch letter, your speaking points. And uh, don't be concerned about freezing or fudging because we work it out so you are completely confident and savvy by the time you are on the microphone being interviewed. I've seen people grow wings and fly and change their entire businesses just by taking this class and knowing essentially how to connect with free media that is there to put their book their business, their service, or their message out into the world. Go to debbyd.net slash visibility, and I'm excited to work with you. And if you're just tuning in after I've started, Debbie Dashinger, Dare to Dream, and I am interviewing Dr. Shamani Jan, who is an Ivy League trained clinical psychologist, psychoneuroimmunologist, and healing researcher. Go to her name, S-H. A-M-I-N-I-J-A-I-N dot 
www.thepowerofthenow.com. And as promised, we are going to have a little convo <laughs> about <laughs> embodying the goddess. So, boy, you said that. I was like, ooh, that feels so good. And I know about 1440. I know about Esalen. They're beautiful places. Oh, you should come. You'll have a blast. Right? <laughs> I have so many friends who are going, who are delivering workshops now at 1440 and going as well. And I know it's sort of like the new upgraded, if you will. Um, I, I, I don't want to say all that, but it's, it, it is a modern experience. It's Northern beautiful. California. It's nestled in the redwoods. The food is amazing. They have this infinity, you know, hot tub that just overlooks the redwoods. And Esalen, of course, as you know, is a landmark. I want to give a shout out to Kripalu Yoga Center too, as long as we're talking, because that's on the East Coast. Gorgeous in the Berkshires. I teach there as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's really to take the time, as you know, to just be in retreat, even for a few days and really immerse ourselves in these kinds of spiritual and bioenergetic practices is amazing. So yeah, I feel very, very lucky to teach at all of these places. And you know, this is the year 2020 is the year of big dreams, you know, numerology, angelically, it's a master number. So it's, it's no joke when they say big dreams, they're not like, um, you know, take a new way to drive to work. <laughs> they're, they're saying like, what is your passion? What is that big thing that is so impossible that of course you must do it because it's yours to do. So if it's about big dreams, then retreats are very important. We must hit the pause button to go in and reflect and heal and then have the energy to come out and create. So embody the goddess, yum. So <laughs> does the Shakti divine feminine exist in us all? Is it accessible to everybody? Absolutely. And you know, it sounds like you really know the answer to that, which is absolutely divine Shakti exists everywhere and in all of us. And as I was explaining to my husband, embody the goddess is not just for females because we all have the divine masculine and the divine feminine in us. But I would say, and I think you could resonate with this, Debbie, and I bet many listeners too, that there's never been a more important time to raise the divine feminine vibration in us and in the world. And you know, what is that about? It's about power, it's about love, it's about creativity, it's about the creative force, the life-giving force. And it's about holism, right? About connecting things that, you know, have seemed separate. So this is really what we're being called to do is to embody this divine feminine creative force more and integrate it into the masculine for pure and true liberation, liberation of ourselves and liberation of the world. Um, because we're really at that point where it's necessary. And what's great is we can call upon these energies. We can connect with these deities. If you'd like to call them deities, you can call them energies. Different people describe them differently. To connect in with our energy system, give us the support and vision and guidance that we need to carry forth our creative work into the world. Mm -hmm. I love it. So um, you're talking about the deities, but I'm wondering about invoking the elementals. Is this thank that you, why you're Thank you very much for mentioning that. Wow. So yeah, you are definitely ahead of the curve because most people don't understand that these aspects of the divine feminine are very much related to elemental energies. And that's actually reflected, for example, in, you know, in the tantric literature through mantra, right? So when we chant certain seed mantras, which are called beach mantras, we're actually bringing in those divine elemental energies, for example, of the lunar force, the solar force, water, air, earth, fire, ether. These are all aspects of vibrations that we're bringing into our bodies in order to support and nurture us on our path. So yeah, you know, there are different ways of describing this because essentially what you're doing is you're connecting with all of these different facets of Shakti, the divine creative force. But as humans are, we, you know, we tend to put things into visual forms that make sense to us. So that's why you have the yantras and you have you know, um, the mandalas and things like that that are basically capturing those aspects of vibration into a form. And then people take it further and they create these deity forms, right? So whether you pray to a deity or whether you're really visualizing the yantra, or whether you're saying the mantra, the point is to do it with devotion and surrender, right? You decide to connect with the gateway. These are like, you know, gateway vibrations. 
So, but what is the, what is the kind of fundamental truth or key into all of that? It, it is about love, devotion, and surrender. This is the bhakti yoga pra practice. Mm -hmm. right? And also, I know that you offer information that's about presence. It's about awareness and vulnerability. And I really, there's so much potency in each of those words, presence, awareness, vulnerability. But you know, it's interesting because we don't, we, we live American, North America. We live in a society that actually doesn't support that, right? It's sort of a joke, uh, vulnerability, having feelings, honoring feelings. And at a time when having or expressing feelings can actually be mocked, how can we harness the power and the healing abilities, the vibration, if you will, of presence, awareness, and vulnerability. Well, you know, I would hope that things are shifting a bit. Um, I do think things are shifting a bit where people are acknowledging the powerful role of emotions on our health. And so that alone, I hope, will help people realize that emotions aren't something that we should be afraid of or dismiss. They're very real and they're very powerful. And, you know, then we have leaders like Brene Brown, right, who have written fantastic books like Daring Greatly and others that really talk about the power of presence, awareness, and vulnerability. So what do we know from the research? We know that these factors are incredibly important for our health. So if we care about our health, both our social health and our personal physical health, then we've got to pay attention to these areas, right? We've got to get present. We've got to not run from our emotions. You know what's beautiful? I mean, we talked a little bit about the second chakra. As we mentioned, second chakra is often associated with emotions, particularly our emotions. And of course, as you know, um, likely Debbie, it's associated with the element of water, right? Mm -hmm. Water is flow, water is creativity. So what is really cool is what's behind emotions because we can think of ourselves as really what we are as the, the depth of this and the stillness of the lake, right? Mm -hmm. Underneath. And the emotions are just ripples on the lake's surface. So if we allow ourselves to be curious about our emotions and investigate them, we'll notice that they come and go like ripples on a lake. And then what are we left with with the stillness? of the lake, right? Which is actually unlimited creative energy. So wow, if we're actually brave enough to begin to explore our emotional state and watch it, we'll see that there's a tremendous amount of power underneath that. But we can't get to the stillness of the lake until we're willing to brave the ripples. Mm, brave the ripples. So beautiful. Feel, feel, feel. Well, yeah, this hopefully is it's not a tsunami, right? Sometimes <laughs> even or... tsunamis pass, I'm just saying. <laughs> Exactly. But, but I do like the idea of the river and the flow because, you know, that is the ultimate surrender, isn't it? To what one feels, to exactly what is, that whatever is will also pass, uh, good, bad, otherwise. So, you know, everything is malleable, basically, but it's about not standing in the way of, but allowing. I think that's so true about feelings too. It's fascinating to me. I remember a gazillion years ago when they first started saying, oh, emotions are energy in motion. It's like, oh, how mm -hmm. powerful. And if we try to put a cap on that energy, then what happens, right? This is when people become repressed. This is when people uh, do things passively aggressively. This is when um, a lot of crazy anger or anxiety occurs and way, way worse, you know, physical ail ailments. So if we just allow an energy to go through to flow, hashtag holy flow, then... <laughs> <I'd>, <laughs> holy flowy. I love it. <laughs> holy flow. I think, you know, even when it's uncomfortable, I've learned that. I've even said that to friends. It's like, it's okay to breathe through the discomfort. It That's will right. pass. It's That's so not great. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about a bioenergy hack for this, right? Because sometimes, you know, negative emotions can be overwhelming and we want to be with them, but we're scared. We'll feel like we'll be overwhelmed. We've been talking about grounding. We've been talking about breathing. One practice that I like to share with people is something that I call washing emotions. So if the second chakra is associated with water, one way to do this on the bioenergetic level and the elemental level is to, again, take that breath into our solar plexus and then make contact with our second chakra, and then actually wash the sensations down the body, down the legs, through the feet, into the earth. So we take a deep breath, and we breathe, and we allow the river 
of fluidity to simply go down the legs. We don't even have to connect with any emotional feeling per se, but more the sensation. And we just allow those sensations to travel down the body, down the feet, into the earth. We just keep that process going for as long as we need. And, and the breath supports us in that, right? Because so washing. Yes. Mm. Washing our emotions. We're clearing our field. Washing our emotions and clearing our field. Wow, there's some beautiful elements to this interview and clearing our field. I have to make notes because I, I like to reference this for others as well as for myself. So amongst everything we're talking about, um, and these beautiful hacks that you're giving us. So the, the biofield therapy, if you will, is, is a model in which we can move away from disease and we can move into healing focus model. Uh, I'm just curious with all the crises out there, you mentioned cancer earlier. Does it hold relevance to cancer care or cures? Does it hold relevance to other major diseases that we're seeing? And it seems to me the longer we're living that there are some patterns that are emerging with health and crisis. So Absolutely. how does it? Yeah, in- I'm, I'm so glad you asked the question, Debbie, because it's really important. And it's the, really the work that our nonprofit, the Consciousness and Healing Initiative is up to. So just really quickly, as I mentioned, I did this study in biofield healing. And while I was doing it, I recognized that there were a number of different, again, Ivy League trained, you know, tenured professors who were deeply interested in healing, um, but having trouble getting support, research funding, support for their healing studies, um, trying to publish them and getting no's from journals and things like that. So we actually created the Consciousness and Healing Initiative to support the implementation and the research of these biofield therapies worldwide. And we're about to release a massive report, about an 80 page report, free to the public, on the state of the field, including what is biofield healing, who's doing it, how many researchers are there, what's the nature of subtle energy devices. We've identified over 280 subtle energy devices that are out there. We wanna educate the public on what we found. There's a whole lot in there. Um, And one of the things that we, have found is that with the research that a lot of people will say, oh, there's no research for these kinds of healing therapies. Well, that's not really true. We've identified over 200, you know, studies that have been done with different kinds of biofield healing, including healing touch, Reiki, energy psychology, laying on of hands, and many others, right? I did a systematic review many years ago Um, which, well, it wasn't that long ago, but it needs to be updated. That's kind of my plug because I really want to update this review. It's important. We compiled the data at that point from 66 different clinical studies to determine, first of all, are these any good? Like, so they're published. Like, is the quality good, you know, and what are they actually saying? Well, they are of good quality, decent quality. And we found that these biofield therapies are effective for pain, Um, They're effective for behavioral symptoms and dementia. They appear to be very effective for trauma. Energy psychology has been the most studied for for trauma, but other biofield therapies are too. And if you talk to biofield healers, they have a whole beautiful explanation of how pain and trauma are interconnected in the biofield and how, how when we're treating one, often we can be treating the other as well. So it's very effective. So one of the things that we are actually trying to do is galvanize support for worldwide research with biofield healing for pain and trauma specifically because we need so many solutions for that. And from what we can tell from the data so far, it does appear to be pretty effective. You know, an example is I I was involved actually in a study um, with active duty military at Camp Pendleton over near San Diego where we gave them over three weeks only, because that's the only time they had, they were like being deployed in and out really fast, right? Because they're active duty. So they were still, you know, in, uh, you know, still in their work. Uh, What we found was by combining healing touch and guided imagery, we dramatically reduced their PTSD. Clinically significant levels, not just statistically significant, clinically significant levels of reducing PTSD, reducing depression, and reducing cynicism, right? (laughs) 
which is really interesting. We'd love to follow that up with biological markers. That's just one study. There are several that have been done. So we want to share this report with everyone, and it's really easy to get. You simply go to our nonprofit website, which is way easier to remember than mine, <laughs> which is chi.is or chi.is. So <laughs> you go to www.chi.is for Consciousness and Healing Initiative. And um, when you sign up as a free subscriber, we will send you, we'll, we're already sending you a bunch of scientific papers that kind of summarize the field, but we'll also send you this report. And we, you know, we encourage you to send it to your friends. I'll give you just a quick story on why this matters. A lot of people are like, well, I don't need research to support what I already know is true. And well, I want to say, just if I may interject, I was laughing when you first brought this up about people seeking proof scientifically. Okay. Because... This is my life. You're talking about my life. Having engaged with these, and I've had so many beautiful, various energetic practices, even completely from a distance with very gifted people. It has changed my life, my being. I'm not to an atom the same. And I am so deeply grateful for these practices so available to us. Um, if people don't even know about them, I swear I've become a spiritual broker. I'm not kidding. I have people call me <laughs> who I don't even know who get introduced to me. Talk to Debbie. Tell her what's going on and she'll tell you who to work with. And I'm happy to be a networker for people like this. So That's beautiful and so important. So consider how powerful this could be for everyone. Uh, the world. From all yeah. walks of life, from all kinds of socioeconomic backgrounds, if insurance could cover this, for example, mm. if it was delivered in the VA hospitals, mm. if it was delivered in the ER. So here you and I are, and God forbid we have to go to the ER, and what happens? They want to give us an opioid, right? Mm. So we, if we care about reducing the suffering for everyone in the world, then it's time for systems change. And that's what we're about. That's what the Consciousness and Healing Initiative and all of our collaborators, which include numerous organizations, right? That's what we're after here. We want to bring this to everyone, not just the privileged few. And I will say, I think, you know, we're all really privileged. Those of us who happen to know about this, who happen to have friends who know about it, right? How do most people know how to find a healer? I mean, and they don't even know if there's evidence. So a real cool story about this is that a good friend of mine who is a healer, also trained with Rosalind, has been, you know, giving these healing therapies for veterans in Kansas City. And one day I got an email from him and he was like, Hey, Shamini, like quick, I need some studies, like really good studies that have been done with energy healing. Can you send them to me? Send me the best. So I sent him my review. I sent him some other studies with veterans. And then I, I didn't know what, we, what he was up to. So I checked back with him a few weeks later and I was like, hey, was that helpful? You know, what was that about? He's like, oh my God, thank you. Because even though we've been doing this work with the veterans for a couple of years now, and they've all told the hospital administration how helpful it is. The docs were not buying in, but when I showed them the evidence base, they gave us $400,000 to implement our services more readily through the clinic. So that's why the research matters. Because when you want to do systems change, when you want to get these healers in and you want to empower the healer workforce, okay, as well, we've estimated that on a very conservative level, it's $2 billion a year just in the U.S., all right? So if you really want to foster this massive system change that we desperately need, we've got to get rid of the fact that suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the U.S. We all know about the opioid crisis. We know about the mental health crisis. We know about the chronic pain crisis. We have to do something, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the way to get it done. So you say, show me the money. They say, show me the proof. And you're going after galvanizing that so that you can produce that very thing. So and we can get healing for everybody. Yes. Absolutely. Beautiful. Thank you for that. My goodness. Okay. Um, so, so, so uh, many people I know who might be interested in connecting with you on that because that is deep, deep, deep. You know, I just want to take a quick break here and welcome you again to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, award-winning syndicated show. And what I do out in the world is media visibility. I'm a media visibility shaman, if you will. I help people who are ready to be seen and get their message and business out there, write their book and write a page turner. I take their book to a guaranteed international bestseller, and I help you to get booked on radio and podcasts and get amazing results. You can go to my website at debbiedashinger.com. That's D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com and check out my program and services. And there's always a class starting. And for those of you who prefer private sessions, I've got 
lots of amazing private clients. And I love this work. Why? Uh, because, you know, often our message was our mess, right? So my wound growing up was about not feeling seen or heard, whether that was true or not, of course, is another story. And it's always a story. But uh, that was my feeling very strongly. And I had to do a lot of healing, a lot of energy healing and otherwise to get where I am today, where, you know, complete comfort zone and allowance of who I am and receiving of other people and all of that experience. So if you don't want to suffer that neglect in your business or being, come talk to me. We can rock your world so that you have a lot of ease there and a lot of results. DebbieDashinger.com. And again, I am speaking with the amazing Dr. Jen, and I'll talk about her second website, chi.is, because you may want to galvanize with her to help the world heal right now. And Dr. Jan, this is Dare to Dream. What are your next dreams? What are your future dreams and goals? I think that my soul will rest when uh, we have less suffering on the planet. That's the truth. So, you know, my dream is really to realize the tremendous potential that we have as human beings to see that realized in others. So I think that I'll, I'll really feel like my dream has come Uh, we have a little uh, froze, frozenness there, um, but I'll just conclude that uh, while we're waiting for that to come back up and say, um, Dr. Jan was just saying she was interested in ending the suffering and here you're back. So suffering, doing the work you do, or are you, do you feel an unfoldment? Is there more that keeps coming to you? Is it shifting and changing? Yeah, I mean, it is, you know, I think a lot of it is simply healing the rift between science and spirituality is part of it, but more helping in whatever ways that I can, right, in whatever ways our nonprofit is doing, mm -hmm. helping people realize how powerful we really are, right, how much power we have to actually change our story. You mentioned stories, right? Mm -hmm. What kind of story do we want to live in? You know, what kind of planet do we want to live in? What kind of state of health and well-being do we want to live in? And what, what do we need to do to realize that all of that power is completely within us, right? We don't need to seek it from the outside. So the work of our nonprofit is really going to help garner that success. Because once people actually know, you know, it's not kind of like, oh, I had no idea what placebo meant for my health. No, I want to walk down the street and have people say, you know, I just had this issue in my biofield and I literally was able to clear it and I prevented disease before it even came into the system, mm -hmm. right? I want to see that. I want to see, you know, all of us sort of understanding the harmony and interconnection that we have as interconnected beings on this planet that are really all reflections of the divine consciousness in our own beautiful little forms. Mm -hmm. yeah. Shamani, thank you so much for sharing your brilliance today on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Debbie. It was a pleasure. I end today's show with this quote from Donna Eden. Several energy fields apparently work in concert in governing fundamental biological processes, including a biofield surrounding the body, local fields concentrated in specific areas of the body, and pathways that regulate the flow of energy within the body. These fields, interestingly, correspond with energy systems that have been described in the healing traditions of other cultures. Specifically, ancient constructs adopted into our language as the aura, biofields, the chakras, local fields, and the meridians, energy pathways, are finding empirical support in modern laboratories. Tune in to our upcoming interviews, subscribe to the Dare to Dream podcast to hear the number one transformation conversation. Next guest will be James Redfield from Celestine Prophecies, the channel Paul Selig, and the amazing third time on our show, Dr. Sue Mortar. And if you're loving the podcast and you would like to actually see me and the guest, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger and watch us. Thank you for joining on the show today. And remember, the secret of success is having the courage to begin in the first place.